Sunday nights, we're in a study on the book of Revelation. And, of course, the word Revelation is the word apocalypsis, A-P-O, A-P-O, K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S, apocalypsis. That's the word Revelation. We say apocalypse, and uh, uh, we usually identify when, we, when you hear somebody say apocalypse, they start talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Well, you find the four horsemen in the sixth chapter of Revelation, and the four horsemen are identified with the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast, the four judgments of God, all through the Old Testament. Apocalypsis is a construction of apo, meaning off, with, with, and the word kalupto, K-A-L-U-P-T-O. That word is the word cover, off with the cover, or a removal of the cover. Now, what this is doing, what the book of Revelation is doing I've tried to explain this to people. It's not talking about just at the end of time what's going to be going on. This is talking about off with the cover. When John sees these visions, John sees a vision of things that will be here and when he says hereafter. So he's talking about what will be when he sees the vision from there all the way to the end of time. And this is the revelation of Jesus, of Jesus. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. When you read the first verse of the first chapter of Revelation, it tells you right here the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what this is about. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He's not talking about something a long time off in the future, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, the book of Revelation is a Jewish book. You've got the temple in the book of Revelation. You have the seven candlesticks. We know that's, uh, that's uh, a Jewish cultural item of the temple. Uh, you've, got the, uh, you've got the altar of incense. You've got the throne of God, which was the Ark of the Covenant. You've got the brazen sea. It's called the glassy sea in the fourth chapter of Revelation. It's also called the glassy sea over in the 15th chapter of Revelation. What this is talking about is the revelation of Jesus in his church for a 2,000-year period there. That's what this is talking about. And we're talking about that 2,000-year period in uh, in the 20th chapter. Let's go back to the 20th chapter of Revelation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through uh, the sevens as I have been because most people, I've done about 34, 35 tapes on the book of Revelation so far in this series, and I've gone through the sevens. Seven was a number of completeness. You've got sevens throughout the entire book. Uh, Of course, you've got seven candlesticks and seven heads and seven crowns and seven last plagues and seven mountains and seven kings and seven golden vials and seven churches, seven spirits, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven candlesticks, seven stars, seven lamps, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, and seven thunders. All through the book. Well, seven is a number of righteous completion. That's what it actually means in the Hebrew. Now, we're talking about Revelation 20. Now, where most people, where they come up with this thousand-year reign is out of the 20th chapter of Revelation. And let's go back over here to Revelation, the 20th chapter. Uh, We see the end of Revelation throughout the book. I've said this before. Uh, You find the the end of time in Revelation, the 6th chapter, where they cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them. You find the end of time in the 8th chapter of Revelation when you see the mountain burning Uh, which is Babylon, and you see the angels uh, sounding the trumpets. You see the end of time in the 10th chapter of Revelation, when time is no longer in verse 6, and the seventh angel sounds in verse 7. These seven angels have seven trumpets, and we're going to be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. At the last trump is a time factor or a time element. And you cannot hardly preach on the book of Revelation without actually covering the last trump. 
because you've got seven angels starting in the eighth chapter of Revelation, verse 2, and these seven angels, which are the refined message of God coming from the seven candlesticks. And the seven candlesticks is the refined church. The word seven means to be refined. So this message of these seven angels is coming from the, uh, from the seven candlesticks, which is you and I when we're refined or when we've been sevened. And I'm using that word as an adjective more than just a cardinal number. When we have been sevened, we are refined. Now, we're talking about these seven angels sound seven trumpets, and we're going to be changed at the last trump. And when the last trumpet sounds in Revelation 10 and 7, the mystery of God is finished. You've got two mysteries. You have the mystery of iniquity, the mystery, mystery of iniquity, and you find that spoken of over there in the uh, second chapter of Second Thessalonians, when the Bible speaks of the mystery of iniquity doth already work uh, during the days of Paul. And the Bible speaks of the mystery of Christ. Mystery of Christ. You find that over there in, that, in the, the tenth chapter of Revelation. Revelation 10 and 7, when the mystery of, mystery of God is finished. And we also find that over in Ephesians that second chapter, uh, in the second chapter of Ephesians, Paul says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. And he's talking about, he says, according to the dispensation of grace, which God has given me to you word. And then he talks about uh, how that God made known the mystery of Christ in that third verse of Ephesians 2. And he said, the mystery of Christ was made known unto me that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body as the Jews. So what we are, we are spiritual Jews, and, and these are the two mysteries. And the mystery of Christ is finished at the sounding of the seventh trump or the last trump, and we're going to be changed at the last trump. Now, I hope that soon. I am so tired of this world. I'm tired of this life. I hope, uh, I hope God gets the trumpet sounding. You know, and we talked about how that this is the refined church. The word seven is the word... The word seven is the word Sheba in the Hebrew, and it comes from Shabbat. Shabbat means to take an oath, or it means to be sevened, or to seven oneself. And I believe what it's talking about, when the church comes to a place where that it is being sevened, or being completed, or made righteous, we're going to sound off the truth of God's Word. Now, I know that's going on in my life. You will know when it's happening in your life. I am saying words that makes the world angry at you. I'm saying words that makes the world mad. This morning I went through how that we're being fooled by the uh, politicians, by the history of the so-called founding fathers and how supposedly they were self-righteous. or They were supposed to be righteous, but they were self-righteous. When you start revealing all of these secrets to the world that the world doesn't want to hear, they want to come and get you. They want to haul you away, put you in the loony bin, or they want to beat you or kill you or something. And I have been threatened. I have my, I've had my life threatened. I've had physical harm threatened to me because of the words I preach. And uh, I'm, I really am in a place where I really don't care what happens to me other than I want to stay here for the church. Now, I believe... I believe when the church begins to be sevened and we begin to take the oath to God and we get to the place where we don't care what men to do to us. Paul said, I, I'll not fear what men shall do unto me for the Lord is my helper. When we get to that place, that's when the church is being sevened and that's when the trumpets begin to sound. Now, how the trumpets are aligned, I don't really know. I know that the trumpets have to do with the candlesticks and these are called trumpets. These are pipes or trumpets. And they sound in that they give off the light. The candlesticks, the seven candlesticks is the seven churches of Asia or the church that has been sevened. And the, and the oil inside is the Holy Spirit or the angel. And of course, angel is the word angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. That word means messenger. That's what it means. Now, we're talking about these when, when the seven angels sounds, 
At the sounding of the seventh trump, the mystery of God is finished and the end of time is here. We also see that seventh trumpet sounding in Revelation 11 and 15. Now that's the last trump or the eschatos trump, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-S. Eschatos means the last in a series after which no other trumpet will sound. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the seventh and we get the word echo from that. Echo means to hold. When you hold a sound, you say, here's this trumpet sounding, and the last one, when it sounds, that's the eschatos of the echo, or the holding of the sounds. Now, we're, I'm taking you back to the 20th chapter. Uh, all through this book, when we find these angels coming, we find that this is the message of God in the refined church. Let's go back to the 20th chapter of Revelation. When you study the millennium, when you study the millennium, where it comes from is the word thousand. It comes from the word thousand in the 20th chapter of Revelation. That's where we get the word millennium. And of course, millennium is the word mill and annum. Now I'm going to give you a little view, another view of what I've been telling you uh, in the last few weeks something I haven't brought out in several years, and one of the guys reminded me of it last week. I think it was Kerry. But uh, I had taught on this some years ago. But I want us to go back here to Revelation, the 20th chapter. Now, just because the 20th chapter says thousand, it doesn't mean a thousand years after this is all over. That's not what it means. We here at Grace and Truth Ministries are all... M-I-L-L-E-N-I-E-L. Amillennialist. We believe in amillennialism. Now, when you place the alpha in front of a word, it negates the word as a negative particle and, and gives an opposite meaning. This word, this is not really the best way to describe this. It actually means, it doesn't mean no millennium at all. It means no millennium after this is all over with. No thousand years after this is all over with. Uh, that's what amillennialism means. Do we believe in... We don't believe in millennium because millennium comes from mill and annum. Now, mill means thousand and annum means years. That's not what we believe in. What we believe in is that what I'm teaching was the stand of the church for about 1,800 years until a man named J.N. Darby brought premillennialism into America about 1835, 36. And when he brought this into America, he brought pre-trib rapture into America. America. We do not believe in a pre-trib rapture here. That didn't make any sense to me when I was a little boy and my father would be preaching in a Baptist church and he would say the, the rapture happens between these two verses. I could never get anything that pointed to that. When you look, the rapture, the word rapture just merely means to be carried away. Are we going to be carried away? Yes. But the point is, what is the time factor of the carrying away? It is at the last trump. Now, when you've got trumpets sounding at the end of time, and you do, then we could not possibly be changed seven years before the end of time. I do not believe that. That is a corruption of Scripture. Now, all the Baptists that I was raised around, all the Southern Baptists, all the Independent Baptists, they all believe in a pre-trib rapture. I saw that this doctrine had holes in it, from the time I was a little kid. All you have to do is show that there are trumpets at the end of time, time factor, time element, and you do away with this doctrine of a pre-trib rapture. Now, we find trumpets at the end of time in Matthew 24 and 29. After the tribulation of those days, and the tribulation is described up to that point, after the tribulation of those days, the Lord shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. If there are trumpets sounding after the tribulation, after tribulation, there's trumpets sounding there, then you cannot have the last trump sounding at a pre-trib rapture. 
the last trump is not going to sound or the seventh trumpet is not going to sound till the end of time. You can forget this preacher of rapture stuff. That is without a doubt of all the doctrines that I preach against. It is without a doubt the most foundless doctrine that all these preachers preach out here. I preach against demons. I say there's no such thing. But at least they can twist verses to uh, make it look like there are demons. They can twist verses to make it look like there is tongues, even though the tongues is dialects and, glo uh, dialects and glossa or dialects and foreign languages. There's not an ounce of Scripture that points to anything pre-trib rapture-wise. I know the doctrines they teach. I've heard it all my life. I've studied uh, the various beliefs on it. And there is no pre-trib rapture. We're going to be changed at the last trump. Now, there is a mid-trib rapture belief. I haven't gone over this in a while. I'll give it to you very quick. Uh, let me erase this and show you what, what they say. Here's the three views here. You've got, you've got the... Uh, they say we're going to go through the church age from Christ until what they call the rapture. This is the pre-trib rapture people. And they say that happens at the beginning of the tribulation. Then they say that there is seven years, which I will agree with that. Then that is split into two parts, or three and a half years, or three and a half years, or a time, times, and half a times, or 42 months, or 1260 days. 1260 days is exactly half of seven years on a 360 day Jewish calendar. And we'll go back and cover these right here. This is the amount of time that the church will be under siege for the last three and a half year period of what I believe is the Daniel 70 weeks. But this is divided. Here's where the people come up with this idea. They say, they say well, there's a pre-trib rapture, and they say God wouldn't beat up his wife. They say God wouldn't put his church through this tribulation. How about back here during the Spanish Inquisition? Spanish Inquisition. When they killed 60 million believers back then, huh? Would God put his people through that? How about if you back up, here's what's so ridiculous when they say God won't beat up his wife. Here's what's outrageous. Here's the world right here. Now, if you put the United States on the world globe for their size of actually what they are population-wise, this is about all we would be. This is just, we are about 4.2% of the world's population. Now, all over the rest of the world, if you're over here in China, in China, or you're over here in the Muslim countries, or you're down here in South America, or you're over here in Russia, or you are any number of places in all these countries of the world that have not believed God, people, the believers have been dying, paying with their lives for the last 2,000 years. What are they talking about? When God allows us to die, He says we're not to fear Him that can destroy the body, but we're to fear Him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, I'm not exactly looking forward to somebody breaking in one of these doors and at any moment, in one night, it very well could happen if this nation keeps going the way it's going. I'm not looking forward to somebody breaking in there armed to the teeth and say, all right, Jim Brown, you're going with us. You're going to jail. You're going to this prison farm. You're going somewhere because we don't allow this message to be preached anymore. I'm not just looking forward to that. The only reason I'm preaching what I'm preaching is not because I'm looking for a way to stay up on the earth. That's not it. I'm, I'm just going simply by the facts of Scripture. Now, a lot of people would say, well, you're just trying to be different. 
This is not the thing you want to be different with because the time will come where we will have to pay with our lives for what we're preaching. I believe that. And how many, how many believers have paid with their lives? People say, God wouldn't let his church be, uh, go through all this kind of trial. I heard about a, I read about a missionary years ago. Would you call this fiery trials? A missionary was down in South America, and these uh, natives on the Amazon River, they had taken him, and they were, had a lot of headhunters down there and a lot of cannibals. And they took this missionary and his wife, and they said, if we kill them, they just go to be with their God. What we will do, we will, they took them, tied them up, propped their eyes open, made them watch while they killed their children, boiled them, and ate them before their very eyes. Would you call that trials? Huh? And people say, God wouldn't hurt his wife or his bride. That's stupid. First of all, God's not going to hurt us. He's going to put us through the fire. And if they kill us, we're not to fear him that can destroy the body, but we're to fear him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. If God puts us to death at the hands of evil men, he's not hurting us. We're just giving up this fleshly body, aren't we? Now, they've got the... What they've got is they've got a preacher of rapture. It's an easy out is what it is. Then you've got those of us that believe in a post-trib rapture are at the end of time rapture, and that's because we're going to be changed at the last trump. And you've got trumpets sounding at the end of time. How, I don't understand. That's one of those verses, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52. I don't understand how they get around that. They usually invent something and create something. But the last trump has to do with the seven trumpets of Revelation 8, 9, and 10. It has to do with the seven trumpets of the ecclesiastical year where every month on the first day of the month, starting with the month Nisan up to the, through the month Tishri, their seventh month at the time of the end gathering of the crop, they had a trumpet sound on the first of the month. They called it the Feast of the New Moon. And then the crops gathered in at the seventh trump, and we're going to be gathered in, and the tares are going to be separated from the wheat or the sheep from the goats at the signing of the last trump. Now, there's another doctrine that says there's a mid-trib rapture. I hadn't hit this in a while, but as long as we're here, let's look at that. Now, first of all, if there was a mid-trib rapture, then the last trumpet would have to sound in the middle of the tribulation, wouldn't it? Where'd they come up with that? I'll show you where they came up with, front with it. They took two verses and completely corrupted the Word of God. Go back to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Here's where they come up with this. 1 Thessalonians, fifth chapter. Here is the... Here is where they come up with this. Verse 9. Well, let's read down to that. Let's, everyone says, the Bible says the Lord's going to come as a thief, and we can't know when the Lord's going to come. We have a lot of these pre-trib rapture people say that. And they get this from this fifth chapter. Look at verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. See, you're not going to know when he's coming. Read on. For when they shall say peace and safety, that's what they're trying to cry out in the world today. We're going to have peace somehow, and the United Nations is going to bring this about, and the United States is kind of the head of the, it's like the international police officer and police force, and we're going to go over there and enforce peace. That's what, that's what they're always saying. They're going to somehow iron this thing out when the Bible says there's no answer. Then sudden destruction, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travails upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye brethren, Thessalonians, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. He's going to come as a thief in the night 
to the unbeliever, but not to us. When we see all these things begin to come to pass, why would he say, when you see these things, the Gentile rule over the Jews, the, there in Luke 21, 24, when you see the Gentile rule and the Jews finished, and we've seen that in my lifetime. We've seen the, we've seen the uh, Jews liberated in 1917 by a general of the British forces at the end of World War I. His name was Allenby. We saw that for 600 years they had been under, uh, excuse me, for 400 years they had been under the rule of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And we see that in 1917 the Jews were liberated for the first time in 2,600 years. We see in 1920, April of 1920, a mandate that was issued. A mandate that was issued, it was called the Balfour Declaration. And it was issued to the British Empire as a declaration that, the, that the Israel would be a satellite nation or a vassal nation of the British Empire and would become a part of the British Empire. We see this... We see this uh, Balfour Declaration expiring May 14th, 1948. And we see the National Council at Tel Aviv meeting and declaring Israel a nation for the first time in 2,600 years since they were carried into captivity in 586 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar. By Nebuchadnezzar. For 2,600 years... They are not a nation until May 14, 1948. So we see, we see the fulfillment when the Bible says in, in, in Luke 21 and 28, when you see these things begin to come to pass, the end of the Gentile rule of the Jews, then lift up your heads and look up for your redemption draweth nigh. And then he says in verse 32 of Luke 21, this generation, the generation where the Gentile root over the Jews is finished will not pass away until all is fulfilled. I hope it's soon. That's what I hope. And I keep believing that it's not that far away. I may not see it in my lifetime. I've probably got 15 to 20 years left to live. I mean, that's about all you got when you're 65. Not, you can't really hope for much more than that. Uh, so it's not going to matter either way to me. I get to get out of here one way or the other. But very well we might see. And people say, but Jim, doesn't it have to get worse? I believe evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. And we're going to see great tribulation such as was not from the beginning, no nor ever shall be. And let me tell you, this can move, this can accelerate very, very fast. I saw a... a uh, uh, political commentary the other day by one of these analysts and he said and he was a guy that studied terrorism and he said terrorism in America is here to stay it's permanent from now on it's not going away never will it go away so they are coming you have noticed lately for a while they took the yellow alert off of uh, CNN, they took it off of Fox News. It's been back on lately. It's been, we've been having a lot of yellow alerts lately and they're talking about, they keep saying there's going to be an attack. Do you think these people are afraid of us? No. A man who's willing to die for his cause, there is no way to fight him, is there? Now they've got, they've got uh, nuclear warheads or they've got nuclear bombs they can put in suitcases. Don't be surprised if we wake up one morning they're blowing up coliseums full of football fans or basketball stadiums or shopping centers because they're talking about this now. It can grow bad so fast. If they decide to start exploding things, there's no way America can stop it. Now, we're headed down the wire for the end of all things. I think the best thing we can do, and people say, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Get on your face and repent. That's all you can do. Now, let's go back over here. Let's go back over here in 1 Thessalonians 5. 
Verse 5, you are the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober, not drunk. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, Thessalonians, me and you, believers, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Now this is the verse where they come up with a mid-trib rapture. This verse along with one other verse. Here is what these mid-trib rapture people say. Now how it can be in the middle of the tribulation when you've got trumpets at the end of the tribulation, they build a mid-trib rapture on two verses. They say God hadn't appointed us to wrath. And they say, and the wrath is of God is going to fall throughout the end of time. For the last three and a half years, the wrath of God is going to fall upon the earth. And what they do is they take this verse in Revelation 16 and 1, and they build a theology on this. Look at Revelation 16 and 1. Revelation 16, verse 1. Now, this is speaking of the pouring out of the seven vials or the cups of the wrath of God upon the earth for the last three and a half years. So they're saying there has to be a mid-trib rapture since the wrath of God is being poured out upon the earth in the middle of the tribulation. And since God hadn't appointed us to wrath, therefore men have to be raptured out in the middle of the tribulation. That's where this comes from. Let's read this verse here. Chapter 16, verse 1, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Well, they, these people say, See, we're not appointed to wrath, and the wrath of God falls upon the earth when the seven vials are poured out. That's the last three and a half years. So therefore, God's got to take us out at the midway point of the tribulation. There's only one problem with this doctrine. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9, the word wrath is the word orge. Orge, R-O-R-G-E, orge. That's the word wrath in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9. In Revelation 16 and 1, the word wrath is the word T-H-U-M-O-U. Thumu. These are two completely different words in the Greek. So when the Bible says God hasn't appointed us to wrath, it's not, it, it's not saying God has not pointed us to Thumu. It doesn't say that. The word orge is the wrath of covetousness or revenge. God has not appointed us to take revenge when someone beats us out of money or does something in our lives to destroy us. They have taken these two verses and say, See, he hadn't appointed us to wrath, and the wrath of God's going to fall on the earth. This word orge is feminine gender. And this word down here, thumu, is masculine gender. That's the wrath of God in Revelation 16 and 1. This is the wrath of man because Babylon mothered all harlots upon let us make us a name. And when a man is beat out of money or, he's, uh, or he has to suffer at the hands of another man, he wants to take revenge. These are two different words and two completely different genders, and two different definitions. You can't say God hadn't appointed us to orgay, therefore when the thumu call, falls upon the earth, we have to be taken out. Can you see that? That's not even hard, is it? But you know what? They've built an entire doctrine. They have got books on on mid-trib rapture, and it's built upon these verses. And when it doesn't fit, because there's no last trump at the middle of the tri tribulation. That's right. That's right. Yeah, what is it? I was watching history, so a guy said the same thing. Doctrine of one word. 
said what? Yeah. Said thing, yeah, doctrines can turn on one word. That's right. And these doctrine, this doctrine turns on these two words, and they're not the same word. They're not even the same gender. So when the Bible says God hasn't appointed us to orgay, He hasn't appointed us. He hasn't appointed us to go after self and seek self and get revenge for ourselves. Because the rest of that verse says, He hadn't appointed us to orge, but to obtain salvation. And the opposite of orge is obtain, isn't it? Obtain, and obtain is the word P-E-R-I-P-O-I-E-S-I-S. Peripoesis, that word peripoesis comes from poeo, P-O-I-E-O. Shh, what are y'all doing? Well, you got to be quiet. I'm teaching, Mary. And peri, peri means around, poeo means to make around. What is it that's made around us? There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one wrapping around us. That's the blood baptism. That's death to self. He hasn't appointed us to go after revenge, but to die to self. That's what that's talking about. That has nothing to do with the end of time. It's crazy what they come up with when they... So, back to, here's what we believe. The last trumpet can't sound here at the beginning of the tribulation. The last trumpet certainly doesn't sound in the middle of the tribulation. The last trumpet sounds according to the Bible there in Revelation 10 and 7, 11 and 15. It sounds at the end of time. That's when the last trumpet sounds and two things happen. The mystery of God is finished and Christ conquers all of his enemies. Now let's go back over here to Revelation. Let's go back to Revelation, the 20th chapter. Now I have to keep bringing this up because this is something that people keep, they get into their pre-trib rapture, their mid-trib rapture, and those two doctrines are as foundless as anything I've ever seen in the Bible. They, don't even, they can't even twist the Scriptures. The best they can do is they'll say, I don't know if I've told you this, but here's what they'll say. In the 24th chapter of Matthew, I might as well go ahead and kind of let you see some of the errors that these people talk about. Well, that thing is not wiping off the board, is it? Let me show you. Let me show you one of the things they'll say. I don't even think I've even told you this. Sometimes I think these things are so insignificant, I think, why should I tell the people? But I guess I should. Here's one of the things they say. Go back to the 24th chapter of Matthew. This is what the pre-trib raptures will say about the 24th chapter of Matthew. I, I probably shouldn't hold anything back. Sometimes I think these things are so insignificant that... It's just one little statement after you study the whole 24th chapter. They'll give you one little statement about the whole chapter of Matthew 24. Now, if you'll notice, I've gone through this so many times, but I'm just simply going to skim over it to let you see what the pre-trib rapturists say about the 24th chapter of Matthew. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him, for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Number one, when one stone will not be left upon another. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? Perusia, physical arrival. When are you going to arrive physically? Not when is your spiritual coming, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They kept saying Jesus was coming in 1914, and he didn't come, and then they said, well, he came spiritually. That's a good way to get out of it, isn't it? What is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, notice the question. What is the 
sign of thy coming. Now, here's the way the pre-trib raptures try to get out of this. Well, of course, Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceive you in verse 4. Many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, deceive many. You hear of wars and rumors of wars, nation rise against nation. Verse 7, these are beginning of sorrows. They'll deliver you to be afflicted. Verse 9, you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Uh, false prophets will rise. Verse 11, deceive many. Uh, iniquity will abound, and the love of many will wax cold. Those that endure affliction, the word endure is the word hupomeno, H-U-P-O, M-E-N-O. It means to stay in the fiery trials. That's what it means. It doesn't mean those that hold out and don't fall out of grace. There in verse 13. That's not what it's talking about. The word hupomeno is the word endure. It, it comes from H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E. That is the word patience. The trying of your faith is more precious than gold that perish, perishes. And the trying of your faith works patience works patience. The word hupomone is the word patience. It is the noun form of the verb hupomeno. It's the noun. So it means to be going through fiery trials that works patience in your life. Then he talks about uh, the desolation of abomination, verse 15. Then he says, if anyone says low here or there in verse 23, believe it not. He says, in verse 26, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, he's in the desert, go not forth. He's in the secret chambers, believe it not. He's saying, whatever, when men say they've seen me secretly, I'm not coming back secretly. You ask me what's the sign of my coming. Then as the lightning shines from the east even to the west, so shall also the coming, the perusia of the Son of Man be. Then you go to verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, there's a time factor. After the tribulation of those days, and all the way to the end of the, of the chapter, the time factor is after the tribulation. Then he says, in verse 31, He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet after the tribulation. How does the pre-trib raptures get out of this chapter? They make one statement. They say, well, he's talking to the Jews in this chapter, and he's only coming back. And they're asking him, when are you coming back for the Jews? That's how they get around this chapter. Where does it say in there, in verse 3, what shall be the sign of thy coming to the Jews? Is that what it says? No. You guys read stuff into that. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. They read it and they say, well, that chapter's to the Jews only. Now, you show me anywhere in that chapter where it says it's to the Jews only. It's stupid, isn't it? Yeah, well, they're saying that at the end of the tribulation period, that the Jews, the sign of his coming will be at the end of time for the Jews only. For the Jews only. That's what they say. That from the time of Christ to the end of time, and they'll get converted during the seven, the, to the last seven-year period. That's what they're saying. That is not what this says. This says, what will be the sign of your coming? When are you coming back? I don't know. Jack Van Impey says they're going to go out and dig up some of his videos. That's what, he, that's what he says. He says that's why him and Hal Lindsey are leaving videos behind. So a man where the Holy Spirit is not here, he has no conviction, he's going to go, where are some videos I can look at, Blake? And Blake's like, i got no Holy Ghost in me. Let me see if I can, hey, yeah, I'll play that. Oh, gosh, I want to get saved. Yeah. Well, their doctrine is filled with holes, is what it is. Packed full of, like a sieve. It's like a tea strainer, just full of holes. It does not say what's going to be the sign of thy coming to the Jews. There it is. Yeah. Well, they don't want to take the Word of God. I've never heard any of them deal with the last trump. Never heard one of them. Never heard one of them deal with the seven trumpets of Revelation 8, 9, and 10. And when the seventh one sounds, the mystery of God is finished, and all of, God, and all of Christ's enemies are conquered. Never heard one of them deal with it. 
it's, it was a doctrine that I was raised on. Now let's go back to Revelation 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Gosh, we got to go back to bottomless pit. I can't just preach it without defining it again. I wish I could, but I can't. Bottomless pit. Now, what they say, what, what you'll hear Hal Lindsey and Jack Van Impey say, well, when the scorpions come out of the bottomless pit, it's terrible theology. <laughs> Some of it's funny. If you go back to the scorpions in Revelation 9, go back to the scorpions in Revelation 9. Now, here, let me tell you what they say. It's the most idiotic doctrine I've ever heard. The stuff that they say. Now, here's, let's just read Revelation, the ninth chapter. And this is, the fifth angel sounded. Seven angels, seven trumpets. And the seven angels are the seven messengers are the seven pastors of the seven churches, or it is the seven to church. And I saw a star fall from heaven. What are the seven stars in the right hand of Christ? The seven stars are the seven angels, one of them sounding, and the star that's falling from heaven is the words of truth from his mouth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke from the pit. Now what they're saying, they're saying this is some kind of nuclear explosion. That's what most of these prophecy teachers are going to tell you. It's a nuclear explosion, and it's a big hole in the ground, and out of this hole in the ground flies these helicopters. At one point, Hal Lindsey said that these helicopters were Cobra helicopters. Well, that has been long mothballed. I don't know where they are with the Apache right now. Is that still in, they still using that one? Well, it was the Cobras. Now, if the Apache doesn't hold up, it'll have to move to another. He says, this is helicopters coming out of the pit in the ground, and there's smoke everywhere because this is exploding nuclear warheads. That is the stupidest explanation I have ever heard in my life. It is dumb. First of all, because he's comparing the scorpions with locusts. The locust was something that the Jews feared. The smoke is blocking the sun, is what it's doing. The locust, when you read the first chapter and second chapter of Joel, the locust, God said, I will send. Whenever you go after other gods, I will send the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. These are the four judgments of God. They're called God's four sword judgments in Ezekiel, the 14th chapter. Now, the two that are always coupled together, famine and pestilence, because when famine comes and there's a shortage of food, uh, you can watch these little kids on TV. They've got trichinosis. They've got every kind of disease imaginable. Their stomachs are bloated. They're, they're diseased, and many of them are dying, and many of them do die even after you watch them on TV. You get these two together, famine. Famine and pestilence. These are the judgments that God said He'll bring. Well, the famine came in the form of no rain, all kinds of... Of course, when you have no rain, you don't have any crops. And God said over there in the Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, I'll make the heavens brass... And the earth will be iron. What he's talking about is what, what do you get whenever you have no rain and the ground is dry and parched for three and a half years like it was with Elijah. Or like it was out there in the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma in the 20s. 
it, the ground is as hard as a rock. It's hard. It's just as hard as iron. I've been out there in Texas where I was raised and watched those old gullies wash. And sometimes they'll have a, have a drought for a long time. And the ground will be just as hard as iron. God said the heavens will be brass and the ground will be iron. And God said, if I don't get you with that, I'll send locusts after you. And he said, I'll send the palm a worm. And I'll send everything to eat your crops up. So we find that the locust is compared in this chapter that the scorpions, the scorpions are compared with locusts. But let me show you what else they say about this chapter. Let's go on down here. And they came out of the smoke, locust upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. He's saying the locusts and the scorpions are equated with one another. What did the locusts do? First of all, the locusts are not our cicadas or katydids. That's not what they were. We say locusts. We talk about uh, the cicadas, don't we? That's what we think of. That's not what they were. Some of the writers tell us they looked like grasshoppers, and they were up to six to eight inches long. They could clean a green tree. They could just literally strip it. In 10 to 15 minutes, every leaf on it, one that was rich and full of fruit, I mean a big one. I got a picture of, of how the locust in one of my encyclopedias shows this great big huge tree just packed full of fruit and leaves, and 15 minutes later, it is devastated. There's not a leaf on it. That's what the locust did. So what you're talking about is a destruction when the locusts came, you're talking about a destruction of the bread, crop, of the fruit in the land, all that was in the land. There has to be an equation with the scorpions. Let's read this and I'll show you something else they're saying. They're saying this is nuclear warheads, helicopters coming up. Can't you just picture this? Looks like Apocalypse Now, uh, that movie, and there's helicopters coming up over and it's flying up over out of this deep... Uh, deep pit, and here's this smoke coming up, and a nuclear warhead is going up, and they're going, <laughs> it's utterly outrageous doctrine. I got to show you something else before I go further, what they say. It was commanded them they should not hurt the grass of the earth. Now, I don't know what they do with this. Because he's saying, I'm talking about spiritual locusts or scorpions. The literal locust ate the grass. The literal locust ate the crop. Neither any green thing. These locusts or scorpions... They don't eat the crop. They eat something, but it's not the crop. It's not the literal bread. It's not the literal fruit. Neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. What is the seal of God in their foreheads? Huh? It's the truth. All of this comes from the 6th chapter. When you see these men sealed in the 7th chapter, 12,000 out of each tribe, that's a picture of the church. I don't have time to go there. The 144,000 is the church in Revelation, the 14th chapter. Now, I've got tapes on that. You can either believe me or I'll sit down and hit you with about 140 dozen different facts. Now... The ones that have not the seal in their forehead, where did that come from? Back to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. This is where it comes from. Deuteronomy 6. I keep trying to work my way through this. 20th chapter. I guess I'll be on this for about a half a year. Look here. Here's where it comes from. Verse 4, chapter 6, Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. 
And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. Now, this has been convoluted into the mark of the beast. What did it mean to put them on their hand? It did not mean, now the Jews took this to mean, they, didn't meant they had to make these little phylacteries and put it on their wrist and put these very words in the phylactery and say, I've got the Word of God on my hand. Oh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Paul said, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do it all to the glory of God. When you lift up holy hands, you lift up the authority of God in your hand to go do the work of God. This goes with lifting up holy hands. Then he says, bind it for, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand. Don't make phylacteries. And where is the mark of the beast going to be? In the hand or up on the forehead. Isn't that right? And where is the mark of God going to be? Upon the forehead, it doesn't mean 666. The word mark is the word karagma. When you look at the mark of the beast throughout Revelation, particularly in the 13th chapter of Revelation, the word mark is karagma. It means a character. And it comes from the word karak, C-H-A-R-A-X. That means a stake on a boundary line. Well, where did the mark of the beast begin? In the garden. God said, here is my boundary. Do not go beyond the stakes on the boundary line and eat of that tree over there. The mark of the beast is when you go beyond the nomos. Nomos is the word law. And God says, it is lawful to eat of these trees in here. But don't go beyond the stake where the beast says, go over here and eat of that tree. What was in that tree? All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When a man gets involved in that, he gets involved in the mark of the beast. Self. Sin. What is more evil than sin? 666 on your forehead? That's stupid. To put something on the forehead meant to put it in the mind. That was a Jewish cultural idiom. So if you have the mark of the beast in your mind, you're seeking after the things of the world. If you are sealed in your forehead, that's because you're doing what the Scripture says here. You're putting it before your mind. Thou shalt write it upon the post of thy house, uh, and it shall be as frontless between thine eyes. That's the mark of God before our eyes. The Word of God is in our foreheads. It's in our mind. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. And that's a mezuzah. They would put that upon the right side of the inside of the door with these verses. That's right. That's the blood over the doorpost. That's right. This is idiomatic language. You miss that, you miss all of this. Go back to, now go back to Revelation 9. I'm going to show you something else they say. He says, the only ones the scorpions will hurt are those that have not the Word of God, the seal of God in their foreheads. Those that do not have God in their minds. The scorpions will only hurt those people that are not are sealed by God in their minds with His words. We cannot be hurt by the scorpions. Now, it's not helicopters. Look at the next verse, and I'll show you one of the dumbest things that they say. And to them, to the scorpions, it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should torment, be tormented five months, and their torment was as a torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. 
Now, what they're saying, they're saying, well, see, this is goofy theology. See, the scorpion's sting is in his tail. And they're going to torment men for five months. And they come up and say, now, this is the theology of these so-called prophecy teachers. See, what this is, since the, t since the scorpion has sting in his tail, this is helicopters with a machine gun in the tail of it, and they're going to torment men for five months. They're going to shoot some guy and go, eh, 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 but it's not going to hurt him. I don't know if, about you, but that's dumb theology. What they're wanting, you know what this is, people that interpret the Bible this way? They're ambulance chasers. They love to see people laid out on a, uh, on a highway somewhere. Hey, how many people dead you got there? Oh, this guy's arms cut off over here. Hey, uh, let me find something else that's exciting. Uh, give me some smoke and fire and bombs exploding. That's, they actually say this stuff. Did y'all know that? Have I told you that before? That's what they say. The scorpions come out of the same place where Satan is going to be bound in the bottomless pit. It's not a hole in the ground with smoke coming up. What is the smoke? What is the bottomless pit? Well, you define it. What are the scorpions? What is the smoke? What is the bottomless pit? What is the scorpions? Scorpions are the exact counterpart of locusts. What do locusts do? They destroy the crops. They, do, they would go in and destroy the wheat and the barley crops. They would destroy the bread, wouldn't they? Well, that's what the scorpions do. They destroy the bread. But it's spiritual bread. And one more time, we know what the scorpions are. In the Greek language, you have a noun and you have a verb form of the noun. The noun, of course, is scorpios, S-K-O-R-P-I-O-S, and that word means to pierce. What's amazing, one of the titles of the bread of the table of showbread was the pierced bread, and we have to be pierced, and we being many are one bread and one body. That's the noun, and then you have the verb form of scorpion, S-K-O-R-P-I-Z-O. That word scorpizo means to scatter. It's the same word Jesus used, scatter abroad. It's the same word Jesus used in John 10, if you want to look at it. One more time, John 10, here's the word. These guys, if they would study this, they would understand. Here's the word. When the Bible says God has given us power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, he's not talking about walking on literal scorpions. They will not hurt us. Where is it a scorpion stings a man who's walking around in the dark? On his feet, isn't it? And they will not affect our walk. This is idioms. Here's the verb form here one more time. And why Hal Lindsey can't figure this out, I don't know. I'm not mad at Hal other than the fact he's written all these books and sold them and he needs to recall them all, but how in the world is he going to give all that money back? Hmm. All right. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He that is an hireling, the man who works for money, preaches at a church for money, and he's not the shepherd, he doesn't care about the sheep, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The word scattereth is the verb form of scorpion. Scorpions are false teachers. One more time, Ezekiel, the second chapter. Ezekiel, the second chapter. This, and they, the, what I'm getting at is the same place the scorpions come from is where Satan is going to be bound in the bottomless pit. 
Now, where did I tell you to go? Ezekiel. Second chapter. Yeah, that's right. Ezekiel, second chapter. Ezekiel is a prophet taken captive, and here's what the Lord says to him. Verse 6, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, talking about these false teachers, these people, where he's been carried away into Babylon, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Who is he talking about? He's talking about the false teachers of Israel that have been carried into captivity, the priests and the kings of Israel, the false teachers. Scorpions are false teachers is what they are. Now, the smoke is blocking the sun is what it's doing, isn't it? Well, that happened with the locust. The writers tell us that these locusts were larvae in the ground. They were larvae in the ground, and they came up out of the ground. The scorpions don't come out of the ground. The locusts come out of the ground, and they would cover a section of sky up to 20 miles, one of the writers says, and it would just be dark under that cloud because they were blocking the light. What is the smoke that blocks the spiritual light? It's pride, isn't it? It's false doctrine. When the Bible says in 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, go to 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter. 1 Timothy 6. First Timothy 6 chapter, the Bible speaks of blaspheming the word of God. He says, if any man, verse 3, teaches otherwise than the word of God, than truth, and consents not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is a false teacher, isn't it? This is a scorpion. And to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud. There's the smoke right there. When a man teaches false doctrine, he is proud. The word proud is the word T-U-P-H-O-O. -O. It means to be slowly consumed by a fire with no smoke. I mean, with no, excuse me, slowly consumed by a smoke with no fire. Slowly consumed by smoke. No fire. It has the idea of blowing smoke is what it has. That's what's blinding. That's the smoke. It's the pride of man. And from two five oh, we get T-U-P-H-L-O-S. That means blind. Now, what the false teachers are, they're blind. And they're blinding people with their false doctrine. And they, co they come out of the bottomless pit. That's not a nuclear warhead going off and causing a great big hole in the ground with literal smoke billowing up with some helicopters coming up over the edge of it and looking like something out of a James Bond movie. It's not what it is. Of course, the word bottomless pit is the word abusos. A-B-U-S-S-O-S. -S -S. I keep saying this. I don't know why I can find these things and these prophecy teachers can't find them. For the life of me, I don't know why. All you have to do is define some words. You know what you got to do to find Ezekiel, the second chapter? You dwell among scorpions. You know what you got to do? Pick up a concordance and look up scorpion. That's all you got to do. Why they never... It doesn't take a brilliant man to pick up a concordance. And see if God had anything to say about scorpions in the Old Testament. Isn't that amazing? Bottom spit. Abusos. It's a construction of bathos. Here is where the false teachers that are blowing smoke and blinding the people and blocking the light. Here's where they come from. 
They come, the word bathos means a place of intellectual knowledge. Or a place of profoundness. Profound or profundity. Some place with great intellectual depth. Placing the alpha, first letter of the Greek alphabet, in front of a word as a negative particle. It negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. When you place the alpha in front of bathos, it translates abusos, or bottomless pit. It means a place of no knowledge. That's what it means. These scorpions come... They are in the place of no knowledge that is not in God's church, is it? It's not what, that's not what it is. Now, why these people can't see these things, I don't know. They come out of a... Look, look at Amos. Here is what Amos is talking about when these guys are preaching. Look at Amos, the 8th chapter. Amos, the 8th chapter. When the scorpions preach, here is the result. They had a famine when God sent the locusts, didn't he? Then there is a spiritual famine when, when the scorpions come and steal the word of God, which is called spiritual bread, isn't it? When Jesus said in Matthew, the fourth chapter, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, he gives an antithesis, two opposite meanings. He's saying there's a literal bread, there's a spiritual bread, it is the word of God. When scorpions preach, they destroy the true bread. Look here in Amos 8. That's what this is talking about, Amos the eighth chapter. Verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the spiritual bread, the words of the Lord. The famine is here, people. We don't, I listen to TV preachers, radio preachers, I hardly ever hear a word of truth. I believe the famine is here. I believe the apostasy is here. I am so depressed most of the time. I want Jesus to come. I'm sick and tired of the world and listening to the lies in the world and guys making up their theology and not studying. The time will come when there will be a famine, but it will not be of bread nor thirst for water, but of hearing the true bread, the true water of life, the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to the east. And they shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Sounds like today, doesn't it? The scorpions are alive and well, living in America, living throughout the world. And the preachers are standing in the pulpits preaching this false doctrine. Let's go back. Now, I'm not going to go through every point of this. I'll come back at a later date and do the rest of the things on the... I really haven't finished with the scorpions, but I'm trying to get... I'm trying to work my way through the 20th chapter of Revelation. Now, let's go back to Revelation, the 20th chapter. So the scorpions that have no... They come from a place of no knowledge... This is the same bottomless pit where Satan is going to be bound. It's a place of no knowledge. We do find in the 11th chapter of Revelation, the beast coming out of a bottomless pit, coming out of the bottomless pit. What is the beast? Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome, and Rome. Of course, you see the beast in Daniel 7 like a lion, like a bear, and like a leopard. Well, and Rome is a composite of these. Well, if you got the beast in Daniel 7, the beast rose up out of the sea. Now, you see a corresponding parallel with the sea in the bottomless pit because the beast rose up out of the Mediterranean Sea. What does it mean the beast rose up out of the sea? 
This is very abstract terminology. It's talking about it rose up out of the boundaries of the sea, and the boundaries of the sea were the boundaries of the world empires. I've got a, I've got a uh, map here I do of the world empires. These are the world empires. Did these empires have any knowledge of the Word of God? No. No, they didn't. You got the Assyrian Empire here in the purple, the Babylonian Empire here in the green, right here, and it went back over here to, into what we call Pakistan. Then you have the Persian Empire in the orange here. When the beast rises up out of the sea, none of these empires had any, God had not extended His words to any of the Gentiles on a national scale, so they had no knowledge, did they? So in the Old Testament, the shadow would be the beast rising up out of the sea, the sea being this area of the Mediterranean Sea, and in the New Testament, it's a spiritual beast rising up out of the sea of no knowledge. Because remember, the woman sets up on the heads of the beast, or sits upon, she sits upon the heads. Look at that. Let's go back over there. Look at that. The woman sits here in Revelation 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. Well, the many waters has to do, you have the Old Testament parallel, or the Old Testament shadow in the New Testament very image. The Old Testament shadow is that the beast rose up out of this system and there was no knowledge of God in it. The only people that had any of God's message were these people in this literal nation, little nation of Israel right here. No one else in the world had been extended the gospel or had been extended the truth other than a few people, a Naomi over here, I mean a, a Ruth over here, Rahab over there. Uh, Uriah the Hittite over here, but not on a national scale. This was the place of no knowledge. Can you see that? It's the Old Testament picture of the New Testament very image. Now, what is the waters where they rise up out of? Revelation 17 and 15, the waters where the woman sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That's what the bottomless pit is in the Old Testament. It's the sea, peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And there's no knowledge in the empire. There's only knowledge in Israel. Well, is there, is there any knowledge in the world out here? No. Where's the knowledge of God? In the church, in spiritual Israel. That's the only place there's knowledge. So when Satan is bound... In the place of no knowledge, he's locked out of God's church, God's Gentile church, isn't he? He is forbidden from deceiving the Gentile elect. They are spiritual Israel, aren't they? Now let's go back to Revelation 20. I don't have any water. Huh? Well, I already gave you that. I said the woman sits upon any waters, and the waters where she sits, the waters is equated with the bottomless pit because that's where the beast rose up out of in the Old Testament, rose up out of the Mediterranean region, but there was no knowledge of God in that region, was there? None. God, had, God did not extend the gospel to the Gentiles, to the Gentiles, thank you, Aaron, he did not extend the gospel to the Gentiles until Acts 2, did he? So there was no knowledge in this sea of the world. It's really kind of complex to see the abstract. And you know what I believe? I believe that God has given the believer a way to see abstract thinking. I do not believe that the unbeliever can see these things. First of all, he's not willing to crucify himself enough to start defining these words. He's not willing to look at the beast coming up out of this system. And what did the beast write? Look here. The beast rose up out of this system to attack Israel, didn't they? Huh? Look in Revelation 11. That's Old Testament. 
Look in Revelation 11. The two witnesses is the church, and I don't have time to go into that. Other than the two witnesses were the two olive trees that stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. And that was the priest and the king, the two anointed ones. There were two anointed in Old Testament. And that was the priest and the king. And God has made us priests and kings. And we're the two witnesses of the two anointed ones. It took two witnesses under Jewish law to confirm anything in their courts of law in Israel. Now, I don't, I've done several tapes on this, well, probably a dozen or more. Speaking of the two witnesses in verse 7, the church. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit is going to attack the church. Just like the beast in the Old Testament that rose up out of the Mediterranean region, rose up to attack Israel, didn't they? The beast that ascended out of the place of no knowledge. Here's the world of no knowledge. The only knowledge in the ancient world was in Israel. They were the only ones that had the word of God. Everyone else was serving some sort of a sun god and moon goddess. No one other than Israel had the truth of God's word. Where did they get it? He gave it to them down here on Mount Sinai, didn't he? Only Israel had it. And the beast rises up to attack Israel. Literal Israel comes up out of a literal sea. And when you see the beast rising up here in Revelation 10, uh, Revelation 11, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against the two witnesses. And the two witnesses is us. We're the priest and the king. Those were the two that were anointed. So in the New Testament, the beast is going to rise up out of a place of no knowledge in the world. They have no knowledge of the Word of God. And the scorpions, that's their teachers. They come out of the bottomless pit with them. And they're going to attack the church with false doctrine. Aren't they? I don't have time to go further. And shall overcome them and kill them. That's us. Now let's go back over to, I'm just simply bringing out this point. I believe that you're going to find the shadows in the Old Testament, not only in the righteous shadows, but I believe you're going to find it in the evil shadows of the Old Testament. Everything that's evil over there, it's going to show you in the New Testament that you have the same corresponding picture in the New Testament in the spiritual if people could see this, they would be able to understand Scripture that much more. Now, let's go back to Revelation 20. <clears throat> I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the place of no knowledge, the bottomless pit, the abusos, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon. I keep saying this, he didn't lay hold on a fire-breathing dragon that had wings like a bat and with those little ribs in the wings. That's not what he laid hold on. Laid hold on, D-R-A-K-O-N. That is the word. It means to fascinate. Now, he lays hold on the great fascinator, the smooth talker, to keep him from deceiving the Gentile elect with his smooth talk talking. That dragon, that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. <sighs> bound. One more time. I'm kind of going slower than I think I've gone in a long time. Sometimes I'm talking fast. Y'all should slow me down. All right. Erase this. Bound. Satan is bound a period of time, a thousand years, except it's not thousand. I'm going to give you another view of this. And I haven't by any means finished studying any of this. I only know the parts that I've studied. I don't know the things that I haven't seen yet. Am I going to see more on this? I, yes, I am. 
You know why I'm going to see more on it? Because I believe I can learn more on it. <laughs> if you believe that you've learned all you can learn on a subject, you have. You have. You've learned all you can learn. If you believe you can learn more, we got three teachers here I can see. One, two, three. I mean, Mike, can you learn more about algebra and trig and calculus? Mike says, I feel so stupid. He says, but I see the teachers in college, and they seem stupider, you know. And he said, they don't really know what they think they know. And Jerry teaches in high school, and he said, some of the, he teaches English, and he some of these English teachers, he said, they can't teach English. He told me that this afternoon. He said, they do not know grammar. They, they, it's because they learned all they could learn years ago. If, am I going to learn more on the thousand years? Yes. But I've learned some things. I'm going to tell you the thing that really got me about the thousand years. It's a verse down further down here. Let me show you the verse that really bothered me about the thousand years. When I was a young man, the verse that really bothered me, were, well, actually two verses, was five, five and six. And here's what I couldn't understand. I'm just trying to explain some things to you, what men believe, and along the way, what I've learned. In verse 5, I would read this as a 19 or 20-year-old kid, and I'm going, golly, that don't make any sense. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Huh? I couldn't understand that. Wait a minute. If there's a thousand-year reign, the Bible says, if this is true, if this way this reads, if there's a thousand-year reign after this is all over with, then there is no post-trib rapture. There's no mid-trib rapture. There's no pre-trib rapture because the first resurrection happens at the end of the thousand years, doesn't it? And I'd be going, huh? And I looked at that verse going, I don't understand that. Preacher of rapture don't fit anywhere in that. And he says, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That happens at the end of the thousand years. I'd be looking at it and go, what? I never could figure it out. But if the thousand years is what we believe here, if it is the last two thousand years, if it's the last from Christ, if it's the last 2,000 years, and if there's no pre-trib rapture, and if there's no mid-trib rapture, then at the end of the 2,000 years, that's the first resurrection. That equates with a post-tribulation rapture, doesn't it? Huh? You see what I said? Huh? Okay. If the Bible says, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished, the first resurrection comes at the end of the thousand years. We don't believe in a thousand years after this is all over with. We believe at the end of the two thousand years, that is the actual meaning of the word, kilia. Kilia is the word thousand. It's not the word thousand. Kilia is plural. Is plural. Now, Kilia, one thousand, according to their way of thinking, one thousand is not plural. Not plural because ten was a perfect secular number. The Jews will tell you anything multiplied by 10 was the form of the original number. 10, 100, 1,000 is a form of 1. But the Greeks said that 1 was not a number. 1 was a generator of numbers. So if 1 is a generator of numbers, then 1,000 is singular. Only 2,000. They did not start counting until they got to 2. Since 10, 100, or 1,000 was a form of that number, then this word kilia has to be 2,000. So, let's apply the 2,000 where it belongs. From Christ 
until the end of time, Satan is going to be bound for a 2,000 year period and he's going to be forbidden or bound. The word bound is the word dio. It means to forbid. He's going to be forbidden from deceiving the nations. The word nation is the word ethnos. Ethnos means non-Jews. There is a segment of non-Jews that Satan for a 2,000 year period is going to be forbidden from deceiving. At the end of this 2,000 year period is the first resurrection. Did I say it right there? This aligns with a post-trib rapture at the end of time. No pre-trib rapture, no mid-trib rapture. At the end of the 2,000 years is the first resurrection. What is that? The end of time. Did some of y'all get that? Huh? If there's a thousand years after it all over, that verse says that the first resurrection won't happen until the end of the thousand years unless the word thousand is not thousand. Unless it's two thousand and it belongs here. Can you see that? You say, Jim, how can this all be? When you study these things, you're going to have to dig into this. I knew something was wrong with this. You say, where did you get this about the thousand and one not being a number? I knew this was wrong the way it was interpreted and the way it was translated. And Mike being a mathematician, he was teaching at Ball State. I said, Mike, see if they've got an entomology, entomological book on mathematics the way they looked at things uh, throughout the centuries in the Greek world. He went up to Ball State. They just happened to have an entomological dictionary on mathematics there. He brought the book home. I should have brought it with me. But they tell you that the Greeks said one was not a number. It was a generator of numbers. And they didn't start counting until they got to two. They didn't say, it's kind of like, okay, men, okay. Everybody out there, get in formation. Count off. One. You got one guy standing in front of you. One. You don't ask him to count off when you got one. You can see he's one. <laughs> you don't meet formation when you got one. You don't count there. They said two was plural. So 2,000. That is the 2,000 years and the first resurrection. You say, what do you mean first and second resurrection? By the way, this word resurrection is anastasis. It is feminine gender. I believe that this is talking about the resurrection of the body. Look at, look at, do it, look at Daniel 12. Let's go to Daniel, the 12th chapter. You have to work this in here. Daniel 12. Huh? I believe this is talking about the bodily resurrection here at the end of the thousand years. But for the fact, you've got to keep everything in context. The context here is where is the end of the thousand years? It's at the end of time, the same time period, the same time factor as the last trump. Can you see that? Now, look here in Daniel 12. You're talking about different resurrections. Verse 1, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as was never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. Sounds like Matthew, the 24th chapter. Great tribulation such as was not from the beginning, no, nor ever shall be. We are heading towards the hardest time America's ever seen. And it's not going to slow down. Don't think it's going to get better. Don't believe these politicians. They lie. We talked about that this morning. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Spiritualism will be delivered. 
not bodily, spiritually. We'll get a new body one day and we'll be changed. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead vessels of wrath to stand before God. Well, that would be the second resurrection of the dead, evil men. We're going to be part of the first resurrection, aren't we? Go back over there and look at that in Revelation 20. Verse 5. Did I run out of time? Oh, me. Verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. What's the second death? But they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him 2,000 years. And that's what we are now. The second death. What's the second death? The man died and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. He said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that him. He dipped the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. And he said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and Lazarus evil the things. And now he's comforted and you are tormented. Besides this, there's a great gulf fixed. Chasma. Separation. There's an eternal death in hell that will not affect us. The second death, that word chasma means separation. The word death, thanatos, means separation, not annihilation. So the second death will have no power over us. And we will be part of the first resurrection, and that will come at the end of the 2,000 years or at the last trump at the end of time. You can't get around... If you believe in a thousand-year reign after this is over with, when you read verses 5 and 6, you've got to place the rapture at the end of the thousand years, don't you? Unless we come up with a better answer for what the thousand years is. And I believe it's the last 2,000 years of time. Well, I've run out of time again on Revelation 20. We'll come back to it next week. I want to get down to Gog and Magog somehow. Well, I don't have time to go anywhere, Mary. <laughs> uh, we'll come back to that next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and truth. God, help us to see and understand that you meant for us to understand these things, but, Lord, not easy. You meant for us to study, to show ourselves approved. Help us to see your word. And, Lord, as John said, even so, come Lord Jesus, we are so tired. God, send us encouragement. Lord, let us see the judgment that's coming upon this nation, upon this world. Lord, I'm weary. Give me strength and courage to stand up and be your servant. And God will give you the praise for everything. Lord, I'm willing to bow and do anything you say. Anything, just send it to me, Lord, and I'll stand up on the courthouse steps and shout to the world that your coming is soon and judgment is near. Help us in our trials and our weariness and our groanings. And we'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.